that freedom of mobility is now being threatened. Global gridlock is going to stifle economic growth and our quality of life is going to be severely compromised. We need to respond to this challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Ford. You know, it was nearly six years ago that I gave that TED Talk. We started our journey in earnest that day to become an auto and a mobility company. I spoke of cities becoming even more crowded within 20 years. This is an issue that goes far beyond congestion. It's one that represents a massive challenge to mankind, one that affects our well-being, access to health care, clean drinking water, food, a safe place to live, and even the ability to find work. In fact, a recent study showed that commute time, a key part of mobility, is a critical factor in escaping poverty, more than other factors like crime or brain school test scores. And surprisingly, people living in the largest U.S. metro areas have fewer jobs in their, in their vicinity than they did 15 years ago. So to me, this has gone far beyond an inconvenience. It's affecting humanity and society. Within this confluence of factors, we have the chance to truly make people's lives better. It's both an exciting opportunity and a big responsibility. We have a vision of what our future should look like in all aspects of our business, and it's underpinned by a zero mentality for our vehicles and the facilities with which we build them. Through the use of advanced technology and mobility solutions, we're aiming to reduce vehicle crashes, traffic fatalities, and, in and injury severity, and help move them towards zero. And to use zero minerals in our vehicles that contribute to conflict. In our manufacturing plants, our goals include reducing drinkable water use to zero, and helping deliver clean water to, to communities that need it and sending zero waste to landfills from our facilities around the world. These are the goals which are driving us into the future. My great-grandfather believed that companies existed first and foremost to serve society. And this is a belief that I share. But it must be reinterpreted to be relevant for each generation. And that's exactly what we're doing. As we gain revenue and customers that we previously didn't deter, it's an enormous business opportunity for us. In fact, we expect extremely healthy 20% margins from this emerging part of our business going forward. And ultimately, our vision is to help make people's lives better by changing the way the world moves. Of course, with world-class vehicles, mobility services, and a wider range of transportation solutions. And we are off to a very strong start. We formed the Ford Smart Mobility, LLC. We're hiring new talent. We're doubling our presence in Silicon Valley. We're investing in mobility services. We've created the Ford Pass app. We're partnering with Motivate to launch Ford Go Bikes in San Francisco and acquiring San Francisco-based charities. Now, using Ford Transit vans, Chariot is an app-based, crowdsourced shuttle service that actually adapts to customer demand, complementing mass transit, and providing transportation to the underserved areas. This is a revolution. Does this mean the end of the transportation industry? No, but they have to change the business model. They're still going to sell millions and millions and millions of vehicles over the next 40 years, for sure. But they also have to see the curve. As the millennials come of age and your children and grandchildren, there's going to be a mixed system. Ownership and access. Markets and networks. So the smart transport companies, they will continue to nurture their existing second industrial revolution model, buy to sell. There's going to sell a lot of vehicles. But they also have to move into the mobility internet and be able to provide mobility services. And this is what's going on right now. Many, many car companies are moving into mobility. Ford is right there in the leadership role. 
Uh, the automated vehicles are going to be coming out in the next five years. They're going to be electric. They're going to be fuel cell. They're going to be 3D printed. They're going to be recycled material. And they're going to take passengers from A to B. The automobile companies will keep some of their vehicles. They're not sell and provide a service. The coming together of the communication internet, the renewable energy internet, the automated GPS and driverless transport, mobility internet, it changes urban life. The first industrial revolution gave us dense urban industrial life, public life. The second industrial revolution gave us metropolitan regions, suburban build out, and a more private life where we separated where we live from where we work. The third industrial revolution gives us a nodal interconnected life. Part of the day in our urban areas, we're going to be living in the virtual world, you already are. And part of the day in the physical world, you already are. And part of the day, we're going to be in the capitalist market, producing goods and services for a profit. But part of the day, you're going to be in the sharing economy, producing all sorts of virtual goods, your own energy, transport. And some of that's going to be free. Beyond the market and the sharing economy, you already are. This is the millennial revolution. It's right here in front of us. We just haven't mapped it out. How do we finance this? In Europe, I'm working with the European Commission since two, year 2000. We are finally rolling out a plan in February of 2017, what we call Smart Europe. We have a similar plan that we've been working on, I have with China, called Internet Plus China. That's already started this year. So the question was, how do we roll out an infrastructure revolution of this magnitude across Europe, Smart Europe, every region, every city? Where's the money? Well, we have the money. We just realized we weren't spending the money correctly. And the same in the United States. There's a big discussion going on now about an infrastructure revolution with a new incoming government. And how do we begin to move the infrastructure to create jobs? Well, we've got an idea of a different infrastructure revolution. Not the old second industrial revolution, which is not going to take us forward, but a third industrial revolution so the millennials can now have their turn to remake society. What we're trying to do is to get information for cities about what's going on on the streets that they control. Uh, virtually every place, it's the cities, the city councils, the mayors that set the traffic regulations, the speeds, where you can turn, they build the roads, they put the signs up. And so they've got to get current with what new technologies are coming in and how it will affect traffic in their cities so that they can be ready when the need arises. We have to shift consciousness in one generation that separates you from your children. We need a new consciousness to accompany this new revolution or we will not get there in time. And I guarantee you, you will live in a world you will not want to live in in 2050. We need to get there in time. Here's why I'm guardedly hopeful. And see if this resonates with the millennials in this room. I'm guardedly hopeful because I'm beginning to see a change in consciousness among the millennial generation. And I don't think it's gonna go away. I think it's here. You're beginning to change the way you think in three basic categories of consciousness. The way you think about freedom, the way you think about power, and the way you think about identity and the community. Let's take freedom. My generation and generations before me, from the Enlightenment on, we think of freedom as the ability to be self-independent, be autonomous, be not beholden to others, be an island to ourselves. We're free to the extent we can make something of our life. So for us, freedom is exclusivity. But for a generation growing up on the internet, for you, freedom is the ability to flourish. And flourish means how many networks and communities you can engage in so you can optimize your experience on the planet. So for you, freedom is not exclusivity, it's inclusivity. It's not ownership, it's access. It's not necessarily markets, it's networks. Your freedom is lateral. And we're seeing a difference in power. We saw it with the Occupy movement. We older people think of power as a pyramid, top down, one to the multitudes. But when you grow up on the internet, power is of a different ilk because the actual infrastructure of this Internet of Things platform is designed to be distributed, not centralized, like the first and second industrial revolution platform. It's designed to be open and collaborative, open source, not closed or proprietary, like the first and second industrial revolution platforms. It's designed to be transparent and it laterally scales where millions of small players come together and create vast networks. You provide the talent, 
the network benefits, your social capital rises. Well, we have 10 cities, five that we announced before and five new ones. It's Austin, Buenos Aires, Los Angeles, Paris, Nashville, and we just added Helsinki, London, Sao Paulo, Tel Aviv, and Washington. And these cities, the mayors want to know what's going to happen with this technology. When will it be real? When it will be introduced? What are the safeguards? And how it's going to impact how people live. If, for example, you can get into your car and don't have to worry about touching the wheel, you can work or read or even sleep. And it may, in fact, make people use their automobiles more. If that's the case, the mayors have to get ready for more transportation. On the other hand, if it's used in a sharing sense, maybe there'll be less traffic. But what we do know is that technology is going to impact a lot of our lives, most parts of our lives, and this is certainly one where it's coming, and it's coming much faster than anybody had anticipated. What do you see as a long term? You know, Walter, you don't have to push decades from now. I mean, one thing that is true about technology is whatever we thought the time frame was, it keeps shrinking. Um, and that's been true, really, uh, you know, if we went back five years ago uh, and we're trying to project out 15 years, that stuff is happening now. So uh, it's happening quickly, but I'll give you a quick synopsis. I think, you know, uh, autonomous vehicles for sure uh, will be on the roads and running. And that should give us back green space in our cities, um, you know, less need for parking structures. Um, Mark mentioned a connected, connected vehicles, connected network. That will certainly happen. All forms of transport talking to each other. Wearables will become a very big thing for customers and a way to interact uh, with the transportation system. Drones, of course, are, are coming. Uh, and you know, it's interesting. We're working at Ford with all these different forms, whether it's bicycles or we, we had some tests recently with drones off our F-150s. I mean, it's, these are starting to come together. And I suppose, you know, if you think about decades from now, you know, you think about things like flying autonomous vehicles. 